community members, our stakeholders, please, please show your hands. Show your hands. Yes, yes, in the back. Here we go. Thank you, thank you. So we're going to get started. I'm uh, Robert Hernandez. Um, sorry, we're doing this without a mic. Those are very sensitive for the virtual, so uh, we're going to have to uh, project our voice. Um, I'm Robert Hernandez, USC Suzanne Dork Peck School of Social Work. I teach in the school, undergraduate and graduate. My whole focus is looking at community trauma, its impact on healthy development, really specifically targeting marginalized communities, really attempting to identify the causal factors of a lot of our at-risk behaviors people try to frame on certain community members, trying to go deeper with that to see if we could really scale up relevant policies, practices, and research that speaks to our community members' experiences. And the way we do that is having the community come in and be the experts of their own experience. Our role is to support, partner with. Y'all with me here? And my students know this. The, the, the most insultive thing we could do is just parachute programs in communities, just come in and start to say, I know what you need. That is so, so obscene. And that's what we see time and time again. So with that, we all know there's a big landscape culture shift in LA County specifically, California as well. How many feel California is very progressive? Wherever you live, some people are, a lot of people on the East Coast are coming to California right now. People in the Midwest, I'm seeing all these license plates, Tennessee, this, I'm like, what is happening, right? But the sad reality is that California has placed most, some of the most punitive measures imaginable on our youth. We are one of the first states to really start to try youth as adults. Could you believe that started here? Think about Proposition 21. Think about all this fear mongering that took place. You know, since 1983 to, to recent times, the state of California built close to 40 prisons, 40 prisons, just in the state of California alone. And in that same time, depending on who you talk to, they've only built three institutions of higher learning. One being community college, one being a state, one being a UC. So what does that say about our priorities here, especially for our youth? We have the largest child welfare system in the nation. We have the largest, and my students know this, probation department in the world. These aren't things to tell. It's just like, how did we get here? So right now, as you all know, California, Alley County specifically is in the midst of an opportunity to transform and get away from the criminal genic punitive measures and really uplift a youth development approach, holistic, comprehensive approach to our most vulnerable, marginalized communities ever. Give that a round of applause. I mean, it's been, we have a long way to go. Let me just say this. I mean, those who are following the mayoral campaign, be aware because, oh my God, I'm having flashbacks of the 90s. I'm kind of like hearing some of the same rhetoric. I mean, this campaign has really become about homeless and public safety, those two big topics, right? So and people are already telling certain things that kind of are reminiscent of the 90s. So today we're gonna hear from a host of experts that are really engaged in all of this. And our school, the School of Social Work, a couple of years ago, we've been advocating, we need to really be up to date current with what's happening. We uplifted and launched, going on two years now, a lot of our students here are part of our whole social work minor in juvenile justice for undergraduates. And this is phenomenal because right now as we shift, they're looking at social work principles, values, and frameworks to really create a culture of care versus jail, right? So. We uplifted this minor, um, a lot of our students, show of hands if you are a part of that minor, the social work minor, look at that, give them a round of applause. <laughs> and the key here is that it reaches out to multiple schools, different disciplines, and that's what you need to really take on these challenging issues. You have to have a business background, you have to have policy background, you have to have the traditional behavioral health science backgrounds to say, how could we scale up effective works that speak to their experiences, right? So with that, we have our minor, hopefully that'll fall into our social work. We also have a juvenile justice graduate class here. We have some returns. Show of hands if you're returning. Alumnus, 
from our School of Social Work. There we go. Come on, give them a round of applause. And we have two students. Um, and at this point, I want to highlight a couple of individuals that have been really working to address this issue. One, I want to bring up Dulce Acosta. Where's Dulce? Dulce Acosta and Ramiro in the back. They have been really the front runners. Dulce just co collaborated with us with the USC University Relations, the Community Safety Conference that was held a couple of weeks ago at the Galen Center. Really uplifting community voice with dignity and respect. Let's give it up for Dulce, who just comes from the Ramona Garden doing work with Ramiro. Thank you so much, Robert Ramiro, for your service today. My name is Dulcia Costa, and I serve as your senior principal director for community and local government partnerships under the university uh, relations department here at USC. The service area that I serve is the east side. And why is that important? Because I grew up a mile from the community that I now serve. And growing up a mile from USC, the health science campus, I did not know that that health campus was part of USC. I didn't know that there was a medical school there. So shame on the university, right? That we, at, you know, I'm only 20 years old, just kidding. But <laughs> that we continue not to have these relationships, right? That we continue to ignore that across the street from this prestigious medical school, there's the largest juvenile detention center, right? And so how, how do we begin to have those conversations? How do I expose my student here, Ray Miro, when we go out to the community thinking, man, we're USC, everyone loves us. We have the dental van. We got the social work students giving, giving out some like group information, mental health, and people tell us, F USC. I grew up two blocks away from them and I've never entered that campus. People there don't look like the people like us. How do we pride ourselves that we've been on the east side for 100 years as a medical student, as a medical school, but yet we fail to bring our medical students onto campus, that we fail to build that bridge, right? So my job is to go back to the communities that we've neglected for years, for decades, and build relationships. And I can't do that, like, just because my name is Melissa, I'm a walk-in. Hey, how are you? Let me tell you about a program, right? I do it through our partners. Where are our hands of all our partners? So you're not from USC. I know I see some community partners out there. I see you, right? We do it through the trust that you have with the community because we have no trust as a university. We do it because of you, right? I go into an event with 300 and 400 people, not only because my commitment to the community to open those doors and to expose students like Ramiro, to continue to come through those doors and provide those relationships to our community, to, to listen to the experts, right? To bring that voice into spaces like that, right? Like I tell them, I'm just pitching my retirement job with him because he's gonna do amazing things. My job is just to crack that door open and allow all of you to come back, right? And to serve the communities that, um, that surround both USC and South LA or wherever it is that you're gonna go form your career. But look for those voices that are unheard. Look for those people that are unseen. That's why I do what I do. This is my third event since 7 a.m. And it's not done. I will be visiting a safe park. In case you don't know what that is, that's where homeless families go to park, to sleep in a safe place. I don't know about you, but sleeping in a park in my car with my children doesn't sound like a safe place, right? But yet, that's the visit that I'm going to have tonight at eight o'clock, right? And that's what fuels me. I've been in this university 21 years as a staff member, graduate student, right, of this program, MSW. But my continue, my journey continues. But I can't do that alone. So I need all of you. If COVID taught us anything, is that we can do things alone. We're all the smart people. I don't know where they were, but we had to do something. We had to feed our elders. We had to go out there and provide safety, right? So I ask you today to meet someone that you don't know, collaborate with someone that you don't know, listen to the experts. And if there's anything I can do to serve you, just talk to this big man who knows where, where to find. All right? Thank you so much. Remember.
Uh, John heard me say that five-minute announcement, but my name is Ray Miro. I'm a second-year student here at USC. I study NGOs and social change, and is it's been a huge honor just working under Goose's guidance uh, through the Office of Community and Local Government Partnerships. I do want to highlight a very special event that we recently hosted, which is called the Community Safety Conference. Um, in fact, we have some volunteers here that helped run that conference. If you could raise your hand if you're a volunteer. Come on. So within this community safety conference, we were able to just elevate not, not our voices, but our community voices. We had over, I think, 200 folks there, many nonprofits being recognized, many uh, represented, as well as a tri-county collaborative where we had folks from San Diego, Santa Ana, and LA just really come together, share, share a space where we were able to really be intentional and understand where we are at and where we are going. So our, our theme was from heal from, from trauma to transformation. And I do feel that we were able to really have that space to heal and to reflect and acknowledge how far we have come and how far we're gonna just get there together as Lisa was mentioning. So I encourage you all to volunteer for the next conference next year. Again, talk to Mr. Her Dr. Hernandez um, to get involved. And I love, you know, we love to have community there. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, social work 350, social work 324 class, and such as many of you here. Um, I do want to recognize Monica Alice. Monica Alice, where are you at? Show of hands. Woo! Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> she, this whole event. she is an amazing supporter of what we're doing here. She supported me when I was in social work 350, just holding on, and they would threaten to close down that class. And she's like, no, we're not touching that class. So having somebody behind me like Monica has been the best thing I could ever come across. Again, Monica, let's give her a round of applause. I'm bring up Ron Bugavalia, who's going to talk about a program real quick, and then I want to bring up another guest. Good evening, everyone. I won't take too much time. Um, my name is Ron Rubacaba. I'm the Assistant Director of Admissions here at St. Dan Board Tech School of Social Work. So as you heard today, and you're hearing the passionate folks around here talking about empowering the community, changing the community, listening to that community, and then going out and, and, and making some positive changes, you can do that. And so we, we, we can help you with that as well. And so for the students here that are currently at USC, you've heard about the minor, the social work and juvenile justice minor, four courses to complete. Many of you are in those courses are working towards that minor. So if you're interested in adding that minor and you haven't done that officially, you can do so. There's a flyer out at the check-in table and we can connect you to that. You'll talk to your advisor, you'll talk to our advisor, and we can help you with that. For those of you that are ready to go on to the MSW, we do uh, offer the MSW in a variety of formats. We have the Advanced Standing MSW, that's for those who have the Bachelor of Social Work. And so if you do meet that criteria, definitely talk to me, that begins in the summer. So we still have a few seats available, so if you're interested, let me know. We have our traditional MSW program. We offer that in a two-year format. Four semesters, no courses offered in the summer, fall, and spring only. Students are going to complete a thousand hours of internship in the communities that you want to impact. You get two distinct internships, one in the first year, one in the second year. Okay, so that's a fairly heavy course load. Uh, we also have our working professional MSW program. It's a part time program designed for those that need to work or those that might be switching careers and can't afford to give up work and really immerse themselves two years into a full time program. So courses are in the evening. Uh, internship is done in your second year. Uh, there's an opportunity possibility of doing a place of employment internship, but we'll work with you. Uh, and so we have opportunities for both full-time students, working professional students. And so if you're ready to make that, you know, that, that inquiry and take a look at that, take a look at the brochures we have in the check-in table. My card is there as well. For those of you that signed in on an email, you'll receive an initial email from us. If you're interested in the MSW, simply respond to that, let us know. And then we'll follow up and provide more information. So uh, I just want to say, that, let me turn it over to Professor Hernandez. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be around throughout the event and I'll be able to answer any questions if I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to recognize the Los Angeles County Office of Youth Divergent and Development, Elizabeth Lopez. Elizabeth Lopez, could you say a few words? Who's also graduate of the USC School of Social Work. We have YDD who's leading this whole initiative. Thank you. Share. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Lopez. I'm a program manager with uh, the Division of Youth Diversion and Development, or YDD. We're out of the Office of 
diversion and reentry, which is within the Department of Health Services in LA County. I know that's a mouthful, but we basically coordinate and fund all youth diversion efforts across the county. We are currently expanding, but we're also tasked with working with various stakeholders, uh, some of which are here today and um, other county partners to really reimagine youth justice and transform the system in ways in which we serve young people, treat young people, and really build for their future. Uh, so I would highly advise you all to follow uh, Youth Justice Reimagined, uh, to follow youth just the Youth Justice uh, Advisory, groups and um, a lot of the transformation that's happening towards the new Department of Youth Development, which is set to launch um, in the new year, so in July. Uh, so very, very soon. Uh, we need your voices there. We need your advocacy there to ensure that we're building a real transformation for youth justice. If anyone has any questions, I'm here to ha and happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. A few of my students who are going to um, introduce some of our guests. I'm going to start off first with Michael to introduce one of our key panelists who's also teaching here. Michael's going to share, and it's just going to share just briefly who they are, what they're taking, what they're majoring in, and what some of his classes in social work mean for them. So go ahead, Michael. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael. I'm a third year here at USC. I'm majoring in sociology and I have the minor in social work and juvenile justice. And I originally picked up the minor, or um, actually Raimundo's class, um, kind of by accident in my junior year, or in my sophomore year. But in doing that, I found a passion for social work and digital justice. And I really found a passion for seeing trauma informed training in a wide variety of professions and not just um, in social work. Um, apart from that, I hope to go on to either an MSW program or a CSW program. And I also have the honor of introducing Raimundo Zacharias, who was one of the best professors I've had here at USC. Raimundo Zacharias served five years in prison and received his master's in social work from the University of Southern California. Um, since then, he's worked with both high-risk youth and reentry adults for the past 19 years. He worked with gang youth and adults, both on probation and parole in San Bernardino and throughout the Los Angeles County. He held the positions of executive VP of programs for communities and schools of the San Fernando Valley supervising case management and provided services to gang reduction and youth development for the city of Los Angeles. Mrs. Zacharias also worked on Project 180, a forensics service agency as the program manager for Prop 47 Diversion Pilot Program out of Los Angeles County Attorney's Office that featured in the Los Angeles Times. Um, Professor Zacharias is currently the director of programs for the Coalition for Engaged Ac Education that provides intensive mobile case management to justice impacted and foster youth throughout the Los Angeles County. He is also a part-time lecturer at the University of Southern California, teaching adolescent gang intervention work. Lastly, Professor Zacharias was recently appointed to the USC Suzanne Vortex School of Social Work Community Effects. Thank you. And, um, you know, welcome to everybody. And, and thank you all for being here. Um, you make a difference. You know, the reason we're here today is to see that there is a solution, right? There is a solution to addressing the phenomenal, uh, the phenomenon of California hating its youth so much that we've done the things we've done, right? We've incarcerated them at a mass capacity. We've had the largest you know, youth incarceration rate in the, you know, in the United States and against other countries. And USC is, and, and this is not about USC, this is about the work. So thank you. Um, and know there's quite a few folks here that are alumni that are part of the solution. And there's a, quite a few community members here that are also part of the solution. And the reason this is important is because we need to highlight what are the solutions. You know, um, I'm honored and privileged that, you know, K5740, you know, K57842 has been allowed to teach and, and come to USC and become a social worker and be part of the solution. You know, I, I have the honor and privilege of talking with different um, students that are going into different degrees and they're taking the knowledge that they're learning here in the classes and here throughout the USC. Um, you know, uh, school of social work program as well as the minor, and they're applying it throughout the community. You know, folks like Blue said, and thank you, Monica, you're way in the back, but you need to be in the front because 
<laughs> you know, it's folks like that that allow this to be possible. You know, we bring community members and community partners into our classroom to um, share with our youth, our, our youth to uh, our youth come and they share, but we bring community partners that come in and they talk about the solution and the different things that they're doing. We've had folks from the Probation Oversight Commission, and I'm just gonna, we're at SC, so I'm gonna plug a little, also alumni, and she's come in and talked about what are the challenges that are going on with probation and how they're addressing it. And how can, how can students get involved? How can community members get involved? How can youth get involved? We've had policy advocates come in and talk and you know, it's all tied to being a part of the solution. And that's what each of you are. And you know, we really, I being part of that population appreciate it because you know, sometimes I bitterly joke about, you know, I was on parole when it wasn't sexy to be previously incarcerated, you know, now it's like, there's all these programs. It's like, let's embrace you. The county wants to hire people. I was like, I couldn't even get a job at McDonald's. But um, here I have an opportunity to, to work with, you know, my students. I have an opportunity to highlight some of our clients. I have an opportunity to share the hope that's been shared with me. And with that, I greatly thank you guys all for being here. It's been a test. These classes are like no other. They're probably the most unorthodox class you've ever <laughs> seen at USC, believe me. Um, but there's a reason because there's only so much a theoretical framework on page 183 could get you to without really understanding the needs of the community and allowing them to be the experts informing us, right? True, what we call um, uh, engagement with the research, right? Community-based research, right? Really having the community drive the process. So with that, I'm gonna have, um, if you will, share a little about yourself and our next guest. Hello everyone, my name is Diana Salinas. I'm a current third year here at USC. I'm majoring in public policy and I have a minor in social work and criminal justice. So my beginning kind of started as a forensic criminality minor. Um, I'm very passionate about the immigration law and policy, but I always felt like there was something missing. So I actually took the Texas Academy class as well during the pandemic. And once I took it, I knew that that was what's missing. I think social work classes have such a human centered of focus and applying that in policy classes and in my law classes has changed my outlook in everything in my career path. So I'm very appreciative of all the professors, including Professor Hernandez. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. And today I have the honor of presenting Dr. Abelardo Valdez. Dr. Abelardo Valdez is currently a professor at USC. He previously taught at the Graduate College of Social Work at the University of Houston and was the director of the Center for Drugs and Social Policy Research. He obtained his PhD in sociology at the University of California, Los Angeles. A primary focus of his research has been the relationship between substance abuse and violence and health issues among high risk groups. His projects have been among hidden populations such as youth and prison gang members, heroin users, sex workers, aging drug users, and crack users. He is a nationally and internationally recognized scholar with an extensive publication record in his field of research. His most recent book is entitled Mexican American Girls Engaging Violence Beyond Risk. He is a recipient of federal grants from the National Institutes of Health, National General Institute of Drug Abuse, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Two of his NIH-funded grants focus on examining the long-term consequences of adolescent gang membership among Mexican Americans. Dr. Valdez is also a recipient and director of the NID Interdisciplinary Research Training Institute on Hispanic Drug Abuse. Dr. Valdez received the Award for Excellence in Mentorship from the National Hispanic Science Network on Drug Abuse, and he is a recipient of numerous other awards, including the Senior Scholar Award. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Avalon Valdez. Um, forefront because he's on his way. Hopefully, he's stuck in traffic, so I just want to make sure he's out there when he gets here. Next, I want to bring up Gitika, please, who's going to present on him. Everyone. My name is Vidika and I'm a junior here at USC. I'm majoring in arts, technology, and business and minoring in social work and juvenile justice. Um, 
my major is certainly my how and how I want to impact this world, but this minor is my why. And my ultimate goal in life is to combine these two together to make a difference and empower marginalized communities with technology and answers, both in the public and private sector. Um, and I'm really grateful to be taking three classes in the social work school right now, two with Professor Hernandez and two with Um, With that said, I'd like to introduce you all to Tanaya. She's just 17 years old, but already making a huge difference. She grew up in the system, but was fortunate to become involved with the program that Professor Dr. I have mentioned before, uh, the Coalition for Engaged Education. They were a huge influence in her life, helping her get a job that gives back to the community. Her goal is to become a social worker and not only show you the right path, but also be someone who guides you through it. Something that she believes in and would like to remind us of all of today is to never judge a book by its cover. We are all quick to judge and believe what we see and hear about others, but her experiences have shown her time and time again that people can surprise us. Um, we need people like Tanaya in this field. Uh, she's just 17 years old, so please let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Lisa Blair is a native Angelino and mother of two. Ms. Blair has dedicated her life to bettering the criminal legal system and demanding a more racially equitable society. Currently, Ms. Blair holds the position of special advisor to Los Angeles District Attorney George Gaston. Prior to joining the DA's office, Ms. Blair was an attorney with the Los Angeles County Public Defender's Office in the years of 2003 to 2021. During that time, Ms. Blair was lead trial counsel in juvenile and adult matters. Lisa Blair attended the University of California, Berkeley, where she majored in sociology with an emphasis in race and in ethnic relations and a minor in African American studies. Lisa went, to the, went on to attend the University of Southern California School of Law, where she earned her Juris Doctorate degree. Outside of, the class, outside of the classroom, Ms. Blair is an author and public speaker. Lisa co-authored Race and Ethnicity as a Compound Risk Factor in Police Interrogation of Youth and authored A Guide to Castro. Lisa Blair frequently provides guest lectures at colleges and law schools regarding juvenile justice issues and the interplay between racial trauma and the adolescent brain. Ms. Blair was a speaker at the NACGL conference, Race Matters 2 on Race and Adolescent Brain Development, as well as the National Juvenile Defender Center's Annual Juvenile Defender Leadership Summit. Ms. Blair also does training on jury selection and client interactions for new attorneys. Started and if anybody, there's a couple of seats uh, available. Please get comfortable. Anybody want to come up right here? There's a seat over here, a seat over there. Just make sure. Um, I want to start with this video clip, and I've shown it in my juvenile justice class, and I think it's important and relevant just because of where we're at. And I want to all process this video together, and then we're going to get into our panel's um, questioning and discussion. So here we go. Let's watch this video. Like many juveniles who are being tried as adults, Peter was a first-time offender. He was a child prodigy, winning awards as a young pianist. He's a very smart guy, very smart and kind. He respects everybody. He came into juvenile hall more like the class clown than a tough streetwise kid. Peter always snuck in candy for the rest of the class. But now, facing a long sentence in adult prison, he was learning to toughen up fast. Do you see any negative changes from being here in your personality? You know? Yeah. Yes. Before, I used to be scared of confrontations, and I used to stay away from it. But now, I go at it full steam. I don't fear anybody anymore. Peter and his buddy robbed the house one afternoon. When the owner came home, Peter was caught in the house. He hit the man's arm with a golf club and threatened him with a gun as he fled. He was facing 35 years, but took a deal for 12. The system used to make allowances for kids like Peter who had no prior record and showed potential for reform. 
In the past, these kids would be sentenced to a juvenile facility with programs and education. But now he would be disposed into the adult system without hope, promise, or rehabilitation. So you're beefing up in order to get ready to do 12 years in state prison? Prison has its own subculture, based on fear and respect. And the kids begin learning from each other in juvenile hall that if they don't abide by the rules, they're going to get beaten up, stabbed, or even worse. And in prison, it's all racial. Either you kick it with the Mexicans, either you kick it on your own, or you kick it with the blacks. I can't go into prison and stay on my own and be on my own because you have to run with somebody. You have to take, it's called a ride. You have to take a ride. Most of the public agrees that yes, kids who commit violent felonies do need to be punished. But is sending kids to adult prison the best solution for our juvenile crime problem? You did it. You have to be punished. It's impossible. If you did something wrong, you have to be punished. Of course. But that's what I'm saying. I pray to God to go easy on him. That's all I do. We can do nothing else. We can do nothing else. Are you afraid to go to state prison? Uh, yeah, I'm afraid of all state prison. What are we exposing our kids to? What do they learn from this kind of punishment? What will they develop into from living so long in a prison environment? I think you could. And uh, we've come a long way, haven't we, since that? But are we out of the woods? That's the thing. Like I said earlier, with the upcoming election, it's kind of concerning hearing some of the rhetoric already happening, transpiring. So we have some experts here today that we're going to have a discussion. We'll take some questions as well. And the framing even of these questions can be questionable. And I thank my students for always analyzing and bringing to light how we frame things. Words carry a lot of weight. So right now you hear, well, there's been an uptick in community violence. Okay. Well, what's happening? What's our strategy? How do we address the community violence? How do we address youth violence, delinquency? And I'm going to come out to some of the guest panelists here and just ask, you know, what do you feel causes community violence? Because everybody's quick to say, well, you know, it's because of this or it's because of this legislation or it's because of this group or what do you feel causes community violence? Anybody want to take that question? And it's something I ask my students as well. Yeah, I'll jump in. I think trauma is the, the number one factor. I think a lack of basic needs, and I think it becomes a culture. We become, we become very desensitized. As a culture, you know, as a community, a larger community in the United States, we were founded on violence. We were founded on genocide and torture and racism and things that were very commonplace, like lynching, like the Trail of Tears with indigenous folks. You know, it just gets swept under the rug and not discussed. And I think that it trickles down in terms of how do we handle our pain and how do we handle our hurt. You know, one of the reasons it was said in my bio that I went from the public defender's office to the district attorney's office, and that was not something I ever imagined myself doing, but for meeting George Gaspone and hearing a prosecutor talk about race and talk about disparities you know when i look at the statistics of you know youth who are going to adult prisons historically it's always been youth of color the the youth who are tried as adults have always been you know 90 percent black and brown children and so coming from the communities where violence is prevalent you know it is can't tied hand in hand and demonize when it's perpetuated by people of color, but that same violence is, you know, seen as patriotism or, or seen as something heroic when it's committed in other situations, such as war or when the police are brutalizing communities. And I think it is that intergenerational trauma, it is hopelessness, and it is just 
the demonizing of, you know, not seeing people as people because of how we're taught to think about underserved communities. It's interesting because we talk in class about even the label gang, <clears throat> even the label gang. And here you have a youth, maybe 12 years old, maybe endured so much trauma or just various reasons, um, acting out a lot of that trauma. But once you label that 12 year old as a gang member, do you still see him or her as a child? You start to see a menace to society and we need to take action. So with that, you know, I wanna to turn to Tiana and just ask you, what does it feel like being a youth today? Just how does it feel like being a youth today? What you're seeing, what you're coming across? Mm. It feels normal to me because I've been in my You may have to project your voice. I said that it feels normal to me because like, I grew up with this lifestyle, so you know, kind of used to it. But I feel like um, the reason that the community has said this is because of, there's a lot of excuses for women to leave and to not want to think of the pain and the Nobody would tell me what to do doing stuff like that. Like, if I was told I'm going to be doing things like that, so I guess you didn't think like that because these kids, like, are young and stuff is happening to them. They have no one to, like, help them and tell them it's right or wrong, so they go on to do things that they think it is. So, just who they're being guided by, influenced by, but having more programs such as mm -hmm. Raymundo's. Raimundo, do you want to add to anything that you're seeing? So, um, and thank you, Tonight. And, you know, a big part of our program is, is about, um, it's volunteer, right? And in our class, in the class that I teach, um, it's about adolescent gang intervention. And, and I come from generations of gang members, right? So my family has been in my neighborhood probably since the thirties, right? And we are both gang members and patriots. So, we get into the neighborhood and then we go into um, to uh, serve our country. And when I talk about this to our to our students, I talk about that the foundation is racism. When we feel that this community doesn't deserve the supports so the youth like this can go ahead and be successful, to have those positive role models, to have those resources, to have those same opportunities that this community does, it really says this community is less than this community. And we, we have to address that. So with what I talk about is that, you know, we're also desensitized about how we see. So how we present our youth, and there's a professor that, that teaches here, Professor Oulu, uh, Oulu, and he says it really, really well. He's like, I've never been in a state that hates their youth so much, you know? And California is like that. We're, we're kind of promoted as being really progressive, but yet we've been the lead in prosecuting and persecuting youth of color, you know? We have seen that you will have youth that commit the same crime, but because they're from different communities get different sentences. And then we compare that to adults that commit the same crime and the youth of color still get a far more serious um, sentence. And we're not interjecting resources into the community. And one of the things that I teach um, our, uh, our students, I was gonna say our youth, but you know, and, uh, our students is something that's fear-based legislation, right? So we'll pump fear based on the foundation of public safety, right? Because we all wanna feel safe. And we'll say, I need to do this in order for you to be safe. But we never really talk about what are those consequences or unintended consequences and what populations are really gonna be impacted. And time and time again, it continues to be communities of color. You know, right now we, and, and I was just looking at it, you know, I just saw in the news today that, you know, there one more time there's, there's violence, right? And the way it's portrayed in the media is like, A, it's communities of color, B, they're gang members, and C, it's spreading, right? So here comes the fear, but why don't we stop and ask the question, 
Why is that even taking place? Because nobody wakes up one morning and say, you know what, I would love to be, you know, come from a broken home, families of, you know, generational poverty, racism, generational trauma, discrimination, you know, all these things. And on top of that, I want to be a gang member. Why is that even an option? Which is a question that's not being asked. Instead, what we're asking is like, how much more law enforcement and time should they receive for the crimes they're committing? Rather than saying, what's lacking that that was even an option? Because if we're all equal and given all the same opportunities, then there's just gonna be some slight variations. But instead, we continue to see those communities and the research shows that these communities that we starve out of resources tend to have the higher in violence. And the truth of the matter is communities of color have been conditioned to fight against each other for resources, you know, so. Yeah, it's just interesting. We talk about is safety equitable? You know, is it a shared safety for all? Or is it, I want to be safe from them? We always think about, okay, we're, what's happening? We we'll also talk about how structural design, you heard Peter in the quick film, Juby say, you know, it's all racial, right? You got to, you know, take a ride, right? Um, I'm going to turn to Tiana, and I'm going to ask you, what does it feel like, or what are some of the challenges facing you today that you see, some of the challenges? Um, some of the challenges are for me being black and being, being, being black because I don't worry about what I'm driving in my police flashing the light in my car trying to see what I'm doing, who am I using my car. Um, I don't worry about um, when I go to the gym, it's not going to worry about what I say to them because. One day I went to court and the judge told me that um, if, I, if you see me again, I would never even see my family. And I really didn't do that to my two siblings to even really say that. So, um, okay. And I just think that um, kids like us as you, we don't feel safe because we're in all this stuff in the news. And then we're like hearing all this stuff and we don't know how to react. Like, we don't know how to react to what's going on with our mind, which is violence. Because what would y'all do is y'all hear somebody being around kidnapping people or something, y'all gonna have something to protect ourselves. So I feel like they should have more resources and more, more like resources and better things on the news. So I like my black friends I have to stop the issue and have to do more about the issue. You know, it's wild. Over at Homeboy Industries, they always talk about we see you, right? And what's coming up is seeing, you know, our youth are being used to being surveilled, right? Just in some of these yeah. communities, I, always watched, right? And then I was like, um, I was with my nephew, we were going to we were on the lift, and we had missed the lift, but like, the police was coming, and my nephew, three, two years old, he started running, talking about the police, and I'm like, bro, you too. What do you mean the police? <laughs> so, yeah. uh, being programmed, coded, right? Um, I want to turn to Elisa, and I want to ask the question, uh, what considerations, and my students have heard this question as well, can be made in formulating and implementing a strategy to address today's concerns around youth violence or youth delinquency? Yeah, well, I mean, at first, I think it's important to kind of back up a little because we have all been hearing about, you know, again, this uptick in violence and and Los Angeles County, you know, I just saw a trailer today, Tucker Carlson on Fox News is going to be doing a series later this month, talking about my boss, um, called the suicide of Los Angeles, and, you know, trying to blame violence on the district attorney and on policies that are trying to treat the criminal legal system differently. And the irony is that the largest increases in violence have been in jurisdictions that have conservative prosecutors, that have tough on crime prosecutors. You have the current sheriff being one of the people leading the recall effort, but the sheriff department has the highest rate of unsolved homicides. And you know the increase in homicides is in the sheriff's jurisdiction as opposed to LAPD and some of the other law enforcement 
So it's really not about tough on crime or, or those sorts of things that impact it. You have to look at what else is going on. And, you know, I see some people are still at mass level. I kind of go back and forth. Glad no one's on my left, honestly. You know, don't want to have COVID again because uh, I did deal with it last summer. But we then ignore how the pandemic has impacted everyone in terms of people being isolated. The programs that we know work in terms of violence interrupters and peace builders and gang intervention is being able to physically go out into the community. This is the sort of work that, you know, like Professor Hernandez was saying, it's not necessarily turn to this page. It is sometimes just sitting with somebody until there's a place of calm and rationale mm -hmm. comes back. And so in terms of consideration, we have to consider the folks that we want to help or impact our brothers, our sisters, and see them as human beings. And I think, you know, a lot of my research and, you know, kind of my passion projects that interest me with youth specifically is, you know, and I know some of you, Professor Hernandez's students have heard me talk about adolescent brain development, but a lot of times when it comes to teenagers and when it comes to young people, there's this, I knew right from wrong when I was 16 or, you know, I was doing this or I didn't shoot somebody because I got mad at my mom and, you know, this really kind of oversimplified version of what's really going on in a young person's brain scientifically. And they don't get the nuanced distinction between intelligence and knowing right from wrong, and yet still being impacted by your brain not being fully formed, and how that affects impulses, how that affects recognizing consequences, how it, you know, and some of us, I mean, I, without telling my age, but, you know, I've been practicing for 20 years, so that says something. I still find myself to be a huge people pleaser. It's really hard for me to say no to when the ask is ridiculous, right? And this is, you know, fully formed and grown and knowing about boundaries and self-care and that sort of thing. And you put a young person in a situation, especially when you have all these other traumatic factors, whether that's community violence, domestic violence, you know, missing a parent, being part of the dependency system, all of these things that impacts, I think the major considerations are how easy it is to redirect a young person with a bit of care and, you know, a bit of effort, just like correcting a smaller child, right? And sometimes the question of why did you do that? And, you know, for any of you who have younger siblings or remember your own choices, when that answer comes back, I don't know, that's the best answer that they have in that moment and not defining people by these mistakes and these missteps, even when they have serious consequences and cause real harm, there is always room for direction and redirection, rehabilitation, and, you know, knowing most, 95% of people who are convicted and go into a carceral system, go into state prison, are returning. And they're returning back to the communities that they came from. And how are they coming back? You know, what is their vision of violence if they've had to choose friends based on race, if they've had to put in work in order to survive a place? You know, what does that bring back to the community and to the streets? And so, you know, I think for me, that's always the, and, the, and it's really the hardest part about having a job right now that deals with policy more so than previously having clients, because to shake somebody's hand, to put a hand on somebody's shoulder, to say, I'm here, I'm gonna be your voice, I'm gonna tell your story, that's impactful even when you're not getting the results that you hope for in the criminal legal system just because you're saving the law. Even watching that short clip, I'm like, okay, 35 years, 12 years, what enhancements was he facing, you know, what, um, additional penalties and that sort of thing. Who was his public defender? <laughs> why did, why was 12 years a good deal for a young person? You know, all those things still go through my mind. But um, I think, you know, having conversations, like Brian Stevenson, one of my heroes, talks about proximity and being close to, you know, again, not parachuting in like a box of food, but actually walking with somebody and teaching them how to cook and showing them 
where to buy better food is, you know, the way that you make generational change. Mm. No, groundbreaking it is to have a district attorney's office looking <laughs> as, as it uh, is. Um, and we talk about, and we often overlook that when you experience trauma, it stunts your growth, especially as a child. So that's why you could be in your 50s at times and some, sometimes still operating within that frontal cortex, the pruning process affects the decision making, right? Um, I wanna take a couple of questions from the audience or our guests. Anybody have a question, a pressing question, pressing comment that you just wanna highlight? I wanna give this opportunity, just any question, any comment. Yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Silvete Serrano, my brother Serafin. Uh, we both have the privilege to go into uh, a basement here in Los Angeles and conduct healing circles and restorative circles with the youth. And one of the questions that one of the problems that we're facing is that when these young men and women are released, what are we doing to help them transition? What are we going to do when they get the phone call from the home and say, hey, Kyle, you know, you just got out, come and party. What are they going to do when they go to the supermarket with their mom and they run into one of their enemies? We need some type of resources for them to be able to grab onto before they even get out, right? As they're getting in. So what is available to them right now? Please. So I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> so... First and foremost, the research shows that if there is going to be any successful transition, it needs to start from the moment they're incarcerated, right? But what the barrier is, and I'm just going to say it like it is, because our agency does that, we used to work in the camps and start from there and then help them the moment they're out. But we're working with them the whole time. Let's get a plan together. We're not, you're, you know, we're not about you getting jumped out, but maybe consider different options. And as I'm asking you to give something up, I've got to give you something back, right? So I can't sit there and tell you, you can make more money reading a book if you make more money on the corner, right? So I got to make sure and say, you know what? You can make more money getting into a vocation, going to college, because not everybody wants to go to school, but they have skills with their hands. So at present, we're partnering with the Public Defender's Office. So we're getting on the court order and my, my, my coworker always corrects me because I said the minute order, but it's the court order so that it's a court order for us to be allowed to go in and work with these youth now from the moment they're incarcerated and transition. Our agency, and I'm just gonna say like it is, is one of the few that works throughout the county of Los Angeles. So if you want, I'll give you my card and we can start connecting because what we have to do has, because I'm also a service provider, what we have to do is be innovative and the way we're doing it is through partnerships. So we're like gonna partner with LACOS. We come in and LACOS is the one providing education and the probation. So we go in and we're gonna go in with, you know, the school and we'll be a life skill. So that gets us in the door and then we can start building those relationships and sharing options. Then we'll go ahead and partner with um, the probation officers. Not always a positive, but we have probation officers that are giving us referrals and then taking us in to those same places to start working with them. And the truth of the matter is we need more organizations like ours because we're just like, we got maybe five staff, you know, and this is a county of Los Angeles, is huge, but we need to create incentive so that we can create nonprofits in the San Gabriel Valley, South LA, Long Beach, Alalanco, you know, Antelope Valley, the San Fernando Valley, so that this is an option so that we have folks from their community going in there to help them bring back them into the community with those, you know, supports. And we do case management, we job readiness, you know, stuff like that. But that's what, what's happening, but we're not the only, there's other organizations that are agency-based and, you know, the challenge is, is being able to get into the probation it's the bureaucracy is insane. It's, I mean, we got, we got creative. It's, you know, we're going through the side door, climb the fence, whatever, you know? <laughs> we got to ensure that the investment's there, right? So there's a lot of changes happening. I know Lisa, Elizabeth, Ray are on these calls on this, that, you know, yes, we may be reducing camps. This is great, but what's in place and it's their full investment, right? So 
So that has to happen to make sure there is that opportunity and resource. Um, I will say this, since, you know, anybody else have one more question, comment? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I'm Alex. I am a student at USC, and I also have a minor in juvenile justice. And um, Professor Zacharias, you were talking a lot about partnerships. And I'm kind of wondering, too, like, where kind of like the for-profit sector that might not necessarily sit with you guys and like eliciting political change or like be at the DA's office, but also like has like a lot of resources where they could give. And a lot of them are like looking in ways to pour into um, positive social change. Like where, where, like what partnership would be ideal? And for any of you guys, like where, where do you see that being able to happen? Where could something like USC, although I know it technically it's a nonprofit, be able to supplement some of the movements that you want to so um, one of the challenges just by to, to really incorporate the folks from the community to be a part of is professionalizing the work that she was talking about like interventionists. So maybe allowing us here at USC to offer something like education being trauma-informed, certified through, by USC. That's huge. That's a small feat for SC, but for us a nonprofit, for those that may have not been able to come to SC, that's a huge deal. That that really gives us, you know, this professionalism and, and it really validates what we're doing. The other thing is opportunity. I was just talking about recently. Um, so SE is gentrified this whole area. I can say it like it is. Opportunities that SE could allow, and I was just talking about it because if you're a full-time employee, you can have your family come, open that opportunity more and more to the community surrounding. So that now it's creating an even playing field. So there are more resources and it's, I mean, and it comes down to more resources. So those folks that are in a position to offer more resources do so. And I would like, I mean, it would be great for SC to do that, open up more jobs because then folks like myself and I, we don't, you know, we're, instead of going before the judge, we're going before you to get a job and, you know, now we're, we're coworkers at SC and, my kids and your kids and our kids can now attend school, but also have the resources to do. Yeah. Maybe our parents like to expand on that. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think in the world of like public private partnerships, it's funding community as opposed to funding, you know, the more established and traditional structures. I mean, the budget for you know, DA's office, for probation, for law enforcement is huge and you know undeserving right like these institutions don't have the best track record they're not you know shutting down violence and creating a utopia it's always the community and you know to professor's point the the violence interrupters you know the people who i call first right is never you know like the established um, organization, or they might work in organizations, but I often don't have anything to offer in terms of payment. There are people who are on call 24 hours a day, ready to go to a scene to stop rumors from spreading, you know, and stop wars. And the, the success of those folks who are just like running themselves ragged, you know, that's where the investment needs to be in community-based organizations that are vetted by the people that they serve and not requiring, you know, and it has to be what we call unrestricted funds. Because a lot of times with grants, it's so specific that, you know, you might have $10,000 sitting in a pot that you can't touch because that's allocated for furniture. Meanwhile, you know, you have the a single mother about to drop out of school because she doesn't have child care and you want to just give her a check and you know engage in that sort of direct service so i i think that's important you know not just it's not funding and and we have to change the way the county operates like you said the bureaucracy is insane and it's frustrating you know i've been able to secure close to $2 million in funds for pre-filing diversion for young people, which is something that's really important to me, really important to the VA. And I have to fill out all these forms and sign everything to the point where I don't, I don't even want it next year. You know, it's just like more hassle and it's so hard to actually get it in the hands of the people that I wrote the grant for. Because it wasn't for any VA, you know, positions. It was to be a funnel to community-based organizations. 
as we kind of close out here, I just want to go around and just see what opportunities are there for youth today? What, what opportunities do you see for youth today moving forward? Yeah, I think education would be an opportunity because if you go to school, you can find places where you want to be and do So, like, like we said, there should be more programs like this because if, um, I don't know where I would be if I didn't have this program to help, to help me and to um, be where I am now. And I would just want to say, just having a youth like Tanaya just be here, I mean, most of us get to go home, shut the door, we're good. But having to navigate daily, having to always be feeling like you're being watched, all of this, all the trauma around you, right? And being able to still follow through on your responsibilities, right? Even being here, all that it took just to be here. Let's give Tanaya a round of applause. We're not done until she's sitting in the seats with you all, I'm telling you. Um, and I'm not just saying that. Raimondo, what opportunities do you see for you today? Um, I think there, there's an opportunity for us to share hope with them, you know, um, and we got to be mindful that they go back to the communities that have all these barriers. So as we work with Tanaya, it's her part, right, and our part. And we can't, we can't be delusioned about, you know, she's going to this beautiful community. No, she says she has to navigate these things. So we have to sometimes walk with her. You know, we have to make sure and encourage her because she's 17, she's doing phenomenal. If you know her story, I, I, I mean, she's, she really is hope for others, but we need to empower her so that she shares with others. And that's why she's here. She's actually one of our representatives um, in our in our organization. She's one of my coworkers. You know, I get to see her um, on a regular basis, and it's just being able to to make sure that we have hope for our youth and support. Thank you. What opportunities do you see for our youth today? You know, I. I see the same opportunities that have always existed, but I think the issue is greater access, mm -hmm. right? And being able to Google programs. I mean, it is shocking how much money there is and how many programs there are in the county that are just siloed within these different departments. And, you know, there's no sharing of information. And so often, so, you know, some people know I have 12 sisters and two brothers and 11 of my sisters and one brother have children, right? So tons of nieces and nephews. So, so often when I'm, you know, engaging and collaborating and trying to figure stuff out for DA initiated youth programs, I'm always like, and, and what's the criteria, you know, and sending a text to a niece or a nephew, like, hey, did you know that this exists, especially, you know, for some who are still trying to figure it out. Um, and so I think that, you know, all of these opportunities and like this social capital has always existed, but it just isn't available. You know, for me in my story, it's like I was raised, you know, with a stepfather who was constantly incarcerated and government assistance and Section 8 housing and food stamps. And, you know, the first time I didn't have rats and roaches is when I went to college and lived in the dorms. And I remember my mom sending me a package which I knew was hard for her to kind of put together. And I opened the box and it was filled with roaches. Anyone who's lived with roaches knows they go everywhere. And people were around me trying to like, oh, what's your mom saying to you? And I was just like, nothing, you know, it's private. And that sort of thing lives with me. But my mom and I went to college at the same time, different schools, but, you know, she went to college at 45 years old with four children. And I had no idea how to take the SAT or that there were prep classes or that there were scholarships. And my school didn't help me, you know? And so 
when I think about what's available, you know, everything, there's, there's always been opportunities, but why is it that, you know, certain kids don't get it? I mean, even, you know, being like <laughs> totally transparent and looking around this room, one thing that I always do is count the black folks. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why are there more of us in this space and in this room? And that's always the case. Do they know about it? Mm -hmm. Are there people on this campus who should be here who would have, you know, the life-changing experience that raised class seems to provide for people, you know, if they knew? And what are we doing to spread the word? I just want to say thank you for taking the time for sharing. Um, I know they'll be here if you'd like to engage with them after. Um, we do have a little token appreciation by USC for you. But I also want to thank you all for taking the time to be here on a Wednesday, midweek, about to end the school year. Give yourselves a round of applause. For being here. And, uh, I just want to say our community stakeholders for being here. Thank you. It means a lot for our students to see you here with them, partnering with them. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you to the students, I will say, Ray will attest, outstanding, phenomenal. Their critical thinking is off the charts. I even get intimidated like, oh man, how can I keep up? I'm being real. And uh, it just brings hope to me that, hey, we have the right people in our program that are gonna lead change. Just don't forget about this when you're out there making mm -hmm. decisions. You guys get famous. Right? <laughs> Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you for being here. If you have a social minor in juvenile justice, if you're interested, please see myself, Monica, people outside in the front. Uh, Ron, we have our progressive degree. We also have our social work degree. Please take a, a, a moment to see Ron, give you all the information. Thank you for being here for our youth symposium. Thank you.